Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. If you've been following my channel for a while, then you know that I love to track the International Space Station. In fact, I wrote my Sat Tracker software specifically to make this process easier, even at high magnification. However, that still requires expensive go-to equipment in order to perform, like you see here in this video that I recorded back in July of this year. But anyone with a sufficiently powerful camera or telescope, even without go-to capability, can record the details on the space station by observing a lunar transit. These transits have a very narrow corridor of observability, and even a slight change in the position within that corridor produces a significant amount of parallax in the apparent position of ISS relative to the moon. Red's Rhetoric and I used this phenomenon two years ago to simultaneously observe a transit from two different spots and measure the range, altitude, size, and speed of the space station. Earlier last week, we repeated this experiment, this time including astrometry from both positions in order to measure all these factors without even having to use the features of the moon in order to make those measurements. These measurements that you see in this video are made completely independent of the moon itself. The moon is simply providing a backlight to silhouette the space station, but the images are aligned purely based on the stars. Of course, this begs the question of how I'm going to measure ISS relative to the stars when you can't even see the stars in this video I recorded of the moon on the night of the transit. This is expected because the moon is very bright and requires a fast exposure to avoid overexposing it, and that fast exposure will not show you the stars. If I crank the exposure up enough to detect stars, the moon will be completely washed out and the glare will blind the camera. Here's a very simple diagram to illustrate how this will work. Two observers at two slightly different locations within the transit corridor will observe the transit, and just after the transit, they will stop tracking the moon and allow the moon to gradually drift out of the field of view. Eventually, the moon will drift far enough outside the field of view to allow the stars to be recorded. We can then take the pictures of ISS during the transit, invert the colors so that ISS is bright on a dark background, and overlay this on top of our pictures of the stars, and then align the images based on the stars and perform measurements using astrometry, measuring the angular size and separation of objects based on the stars in the image. This will allow us to measure the parallax between the two views using the stars as reference points. Now let's take a look at the video from my telescope. Here's the transit as seen by my telescope playing back at full speed. As you can see, it takes only about half a second for ISS to cross the moon. Now let's try slowing it down to 25% of the actual speed so that you can see the transit better. And let's zoom in for a closer look. We can easily make out the large solar arrays on ISS even the separation between the individual panels, and we can see the radiators and habitat sections of the station as well. Now let's take a look at the footage captured by Red's P-1000 from 765 meters away, perpendicular to the transit path. In Red's camera, the space station passes directly over Copernicus Crater. In my view, the station passed below that crater. Now let's overlay the two to make it easier to see the parallax. My camera was recording at 60 frames per second, whereas Red's was recording at 30 frames per second, which is why the station's position appears to jump further between each frame in his video. But the playback speed is the same, and you can see the parallax between our two perspectives. I wrote a custom program to do a minimum pixel stack of each of our videos and then layer the two together. The program took the minimum pixel across all video frames to show the silhouette transiting across the face of the moon, producing this image. Red's Rhetoric performed his analysis of the parallax of the space station from our two perspectives by aligning the videos based on the surface features of the moon, and then measuring the size of the moon in the image to determine the image scale, based on what the angular size of the moon was that night. You can find a link to Red's video in the description. But for my video, I will not be performing any alignment or measurements based on the moon. Instead, the images from his camera and my telescope will be aligned purely based on the stars, and all measurements will be made using astrometry, measuring everything relative to the stars. Let's take a close-up look at the transit map. The thin blue line represents the center line of the transit. I was positioned at Lowe's, and Red was positioned at the Centennial Bank.
we deliberately positioned ourselves to be perpendicular to the center line of the transit to maximize our baseline and how it would displace the position of ISS relative to the moon or, in my case, the background stars. Though, because of the geometry of the transit, I was actually looking over Red's shoulder during the transit, so we'll need to use the law of signs to solve for the distance of ISS. Speaking of solving things, here is the image that I astrometrically solved in order to measure the parallax. It doesn't look like much, but let me explain what you're looking at. The background layer is a frame of video that I took for astrometry purposes immediately after the transit. About 17 minutes after the transit, several stars appeared in the field of view, and I asked Red to take a picture at the same time. This is the image from Red's P1000, which is not nearly as sensitive to light as my telescope, but with a 30 second long exposure, it can start to see some of the brighter stars that were seen in my video. Those are the streaks that you see running through the image. The lowest portion of those streaks corresponds to where the stars were when the shutter was first opened. We were pointed roughly east, and therefore the stars were rising during the 30 second exposure. I then took the images of ISS from Red's transit video and layered them back on top of this image, inverting the colors so that ISS is bright against a dark background. I can then take this completed image and adjust the rotation and scale to match my video based on the positions of the stars as seen by my telescope at the same time. Finally, I took the ISS transit as seen in my video and layered it back on top of this frame, once again inverting the colors so that ISS is bright against a dark background. I can then take this image and astrometrically solve it with astrometry.net, and you can find a link to that solution in the video description. Now we can use astrometry to start making measurements. For example, we can measure the parallax, the separation, between the path ISS took in Red's video and the path that it took in my video. We find that this angle is 0.0885 degrees, but we need another number as well. We need the altitude of the telescope, and we can get this by converting the equatorial coordinates of the space station during this observation into altitude azimuth coordinates. If we know the observing location and the time, it's a simple process to convert the equatorial coordinates back into altitude and azimuth, and that is what I did with my spreadsheet seen here. In order to accurately calculate the altitude, I need to use the time of the astrometric observation, not the transit observation, because we're converting equatorial coordinates of the stars taken minutes after the transit in order to get the altitude of the telescope. Because the telescope was powered off, that altitude had not changed from the time of the transit. So now we return to my very simple diagram to illustrate how we can calculate the range to ISS, the distance from the telescope. We know the baseline is 765 meters, or 0.765 kilometers. We know the altitude of the telescope was about 65.68 degrees, and we know the parallax angle was 0.0885 degrees. So we can plug all of this in with the law of sines and solve for the distance of ISS. So if we plug all this in, we find that ISS was about 451 kilometers away during the transit, but that's a slant range not the altitude of ISS over the surface of the Earth. So we need to solve a different triangle if we want the actual altitude of ISS over the Earth. So here's the triangle we need to solve if we want to determine what the altitude of ISS was over the surface of the Earth. We know the slant range A was 451 kilometers, and we know the radius of Earth B, 6,371 kilometers. C is equal to the ISS altitude over the surface of Earth plus the radius of Earth. So if we subtract the radius of Earth from our answer C, we will get the actual altitude of the space station. So plugging all of this in, we arrive at an altitude just shy of about 414 kilometers, which is within about 1% of our expected altitude based on the orbit. Now that we know the distance of the space station from the telescope, we can also determine the station's physical size. If we measure the angular size of the space station, we find that it was about 0.0131267 degrees across in the image. If we take the tangent of that number and multiply it times the distance of 451,300 meters, we find that the space station has a physical size of about 103.39 meters. That's within about 5 meters of the expected value. Lastly, we can use the length of the transit path to measure the velocity of the space station. 
I measured the transit length across 29 of the 30 video frames recorded by my camera. On the first frame, ISS was just crossing over the limb of the moon, and there were a lot of dark craters there, not providing much contrast for the silhouetted space station. But across the remaining 29 frames, ISS covered an angular size of 0.419972 degrees in 29 frames, or about 0.483 seconds. If we take the tangent of that angular length and multiply times the range of 451.3 kilometers, we find that it covered about 3.3 kilometers in about 0.483 seconds. In other words, it was traveling at about 6.8 kilometers per second relative to the ground below. But if we also include Earth's rotation into that equation and account for the 409 meter per second velocity of the surface that I'm standing on as I'm filming this, we find that the total velocity of the space station was actually north of 7 kilometers per second. In other words, it was indeed traveling at orbital velocity. So, in conclusion, I was able to use the parallax of this transit to measure the distance, altitude, size, and speed of the space station. And I want to reiterate once more that the moon's distance and size does not matter. It does not factor into these calculations at all, because all of these calculations were performed using astrometry from both positions, measuring everything based on the stars. Even the images were aligned relative to each other, using the stars, not the surface features of the moon. So the only thing the moon provided for the purposes of this video was its illumination to silhouette the space station. But beyond that, nothing about the moon matters for the purposes of this video. The techniques I used to make these measurements are distinct from the techniques that Red used in his video, and we performed our calculations completely independent of each other, only comparing our results at the very end, and we do indeed find that our results are in close agreement with each other. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and if you encounter anyone who has questions about whether or not the space station is really in orbit, feel free to share this video. Until next time, clear skies folks.